Welcome to Mormon Land, a podcast all about the news and culture of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I am Senior Managing Editor Dave Noyce. I oversee the Salt Lake Tribune's faith coverage. I'm joined by Senior Religion Reporter Peggy Fletcher Stack. Hi, Peggy. Hi, Dave. Before we start, here's a quick ask. We invite you to go to patreon.com, where for as little as $3 a month, you can access all of the Tribune's faith coverage podcast transcripts, and the full Mormon Land newsletter. Again, that's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Mormon Land. And if you haven't already, please follow us on Instagram at Mormon dot land. Now for today's episode. 46 years ago this month, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints under President Spencer W. Kimball lifted its prohibition preventing black men from entering the all-male priesthood and black women and men from participating in temple rites. This historic shift, the most significant since the faith stopped practicing polygamy, abruptly ended this racist ban, but it hardly ended racism within the church. After all, 126 years of theological justifications for the ban remained, including influential works such as Mormon Doctrine by Apostle Bruce R. McConkie. No, cleanup still needed and needs to be done. Building on President Gordon B. Hinckley's outreach efforts, current church leader Russell M. Nelson has called on members to lead out against racism and has cemented ties with the NAACP. Matthew Harris's new book, Second Class Saints, Black Mormons and the Struggle for Racial Equality, explores the history of the priesthood temple ban from its racist roots under Brigham Young to its removal and its aftermath with an eye especially on its effects on Black Latter-day Saints. With unprecedented access to the papers of Bruce McConkie, UB Brown, Joseph Fielding Smith and Spencer W. Kimball, Harris offers an insider view of the decision-making process among the church hierarchy regarding the issues of race and this momentous move. He joins us today on Google Meet from Colorado. Matt, welcome. Thank you, Dave and Peggy. Nice to be here today. So let's dive right in. And and there's probably a lot you can say, but you can kind of give us a brief overview. I, I think a lot of people may not know that President Kimball was ready to lift this ban months or even years before he did so. Why did he wait? A couple of reasons, I think. One would be that he needed to have consensus in the Quorum of the Twelve. And the church uh, teaches that new doctrinal uh, changes or policy changes need to have uh, unanimity among the highest leaders. And so it took some time to get to work with the apostles who were had reservations about lifting the ban. And secondly, President Kimball, when he was ordained the church president in 1974, he recognized that it collided with his globalist vision to move the church into the world. And that included majority black and biracial countries. And it would be hard to missionize in those areas if you had this ban in place. And so those two factors, I think, were critical uh, in pushing this ban uh, to its demise. Yeah, I'm, I will probably touch on some of this uh, later, too. But what were some of the pressures the church was facing? Uh, you, you mentioned one about the global vision that President Kimball spelled out in a landmark speech. But what were some of the pressures that this ban was putting on the churches and its expansionist efforts? Well, one was just the criticisms. I mean, the brethren were, were getting just nailed everywhere they went. They were getting criticized by not just members of the media, but also insiders. And in 1974, at the dedication of the Washington, D.C. temple, this really special time, and this is, I should say, parenthetically, my temple. I grew up on the east, and we did excursions to from Maine, where I grew up, to Washington, D.C., to visit this beautiful edifice. But anyway, at 1974, at the uh, dedication of this temple, um, they, they sermonize, they dedicate the temple. It's a special moment. And all of a sudden, the media shows up, and they start asking questions. And the first thing they want to know is, when are you going to lift the ban? And President Kimball is just furious, you know, thinking they would ask questions about this special temple. What did you what do you do in there? But it's about lifting the ban. And everywhere he went, it seemed that he was being asked about the ban. Also, there was a loud and growing chorus of members who were upset about the ban. They felt like they couldn't justify it to their colleagues, to their family members. And in 1974, just within months of President Kimball expressing frustration at the D.C. uh, temple dedication, Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve gave a sermon in general conference. And in that sermon, he sort of spelled out a litmus test. Are we valiant in our testimonies if we're questioning the priesthood ban? So there's a there's a rumbling from among the saints 
that uh, especially after the civil rights movement had ended, that it's time for the church to reconsider this longstanding ban. Talk about how at one point, I think you have a sentence that says something like the road to lifting the ban would go through Brazil. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. President Kimball, I mean, he was truly a visionary and he recognized intuitively that it was really, really difficult to build a temple in biracial Brazil. I mean, this is a this is a country that has a long history of slavery and interracial marriage. And when President Kimball was ordained the next church president, plans were already underway from his predecessor, Harold B. Lee, to build a temple there. And it really, really gnawed at President Kimball that the, so many of the black and biracial uh, Portuguese saints were donating their money and their time to build a temple that they would not be permitted to enter. And it really, really tugged at his heartstrings. And so he knew that the ban had to go in order to ins- you know, ensure attendance at this uh, sacred building. But yet most, they were kept out because of the ban. And so President Kimball um, realized that he had to change the view of some of the holdouts one by one, and that wasn't an easy thing. And he spent most of the early years of his presidency trying to meet with the brethren collectively and individually to get them to see the wisdom of lifting the ban because of what's going on in Brazil. So let's look back at some of the pre, you know, before the ban was lifted. Tell us about uh, the Civil Rights Commission that uh, went to BYU in 1968. What did they what did they conclude and how did then President Ernest Wilkinson balance that with church leaders? So in 1964, the American Civil Rights Act was passed and the Justice Department under Lyndon Johnson decided that they were going to go after institutions that received federal funding, institutions that had discriminatory policies. And they looked at a number of universities and they decided or discovered that BYU had three African-American students in the mid 60s. And so BYU was a prime target for their investigation. And they sent Ernest Wilkinson a letter in um, in 1968 suggesting that they were going to send a three-man investigatory team from the Department of Justice to look into BYU's policies. And when Wilkinson received the letter, he panicked because, you know, with only three African-American members, this didn't bode well for BYU. And uh, initially, Wilkinson told the uh, investigation team when they arrived on campus in April of 68, he said that we don't have any policies that discriminate against Black people. And so on the face of the literature, that was true. Wilkinson was too clever to put, you know, if you're black, you're not welcome here. But he didn't anticipate how the investigators would read the promotional literature. It said something like, you know, we 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 recruit students in the Pacific Islands, in South America, Central America. We have this growing cosmopolitan campus. And when the investigators asked, well, where are black people? And (laughs) Wilkinson stumbled. And so he didn't feel comfortable explaining the church's race theology to the investigators. So he calls in the religion dean, a man by the name of David Yarn. And he says, Yarn, you tell them why we don't allow black people or restrict them from the priesthood in the temple. And so uh, Dean Yarn goes through all the traditional rationales and the investigators are just flummoxed. I mean, this makes no sense to them. It's just rank discrimination. And so what happens is, is that that initial site visit 1968 sets in uh, the first domino uh, in effect, if you will, that will ultimately lead to BYU allowing black students, black student athletes, I should say, giving them athletic scholarships. Um, It allows them to come into the campus to be recruited by the campus because the investigation team essentially said, if you don't increase your uh, black population, we're going to defund you. We're going to make sure that you can't, your students can't use the GI Bill. We're going to rob your science faculty of federal grants. This is a nice way of saying we're going to shut your doors. And Wilkinson's a lawyer, and he does his best to hide behind the First Amendment. We have a right to religious freedom. 
But the truth is, President Wilkinson knows that he's fighting an uphill battle because the Justice Department has already signified its intentions to universities like BYU that you can't hide behind the First Amendment to discriminate. And of course, the fear underlying all of this is interracial marriage, that if you allow um, black uh, student athletes and other black students into BYU, then uh, it'll lead to interracial marriage. I should say one last thing about this question or this comment, uh, and that is that Wilkinson doesn't capitulate easy. At first, he tells the Justice Department, he said, that we will send letters to black students in Wyoming and Utah. And he thinks that by sending letters into majority white states, that's going to get the feds off his back. But the feds, they write him back and they say, look, we don't care about your silly letters. We care about results. So if you don't produce results within a year, then we're going to come back uh, at you again. And so Wilkinson has to really show that they're increasing the black uh, student population And by November of 1970, Wilkinson goes to the board of trustees comprised of the leaders who run the church. And he tells them, he said, they're going to shut us down if we don't recruit black athletes. We've been saying for a long time that we have no discriminatory policies, but you know, and I know that we have discriminatory policies. We can't keep this up. They're on to us. And that's really a defining moment for BYU because after President Wilkinson convinces the board that the policies have to change, that's when they start to recruit their first black athletes. Um, so also in that chapter, you talk about um, people who were pushing President David O. McKay to end the temple priesthood ban, uh, including U.B. Brown and McKay's own sons. Uh, it, it's a fascinating chapter. Who was working to, you know, there was hope that those men had hope that he would do it before he died, but he was failing in health. Who was pushing back? Who are the main antagonists to the McKay's going to end the ban? Well, there one of the things I note in the book is that there are a few um, intellectuals who are pushing this 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 opposition forward. A uh, guy by the name of Sterling McMurrin, who taught philosophy at the University of Utah, one time uh, seminary and institute teacher for the church, also a beloved American or Mormon uh, hero for at least some Latter-day Saints, a guy named Lowell Benyon, who taught institute at um, the University of Utah uh, for some 26 years. And then the third person was an um, an obscure figure named Larry Nelson, who taught at BYU at one point in the 1920s, taught Marky Peterson, Ezra Taft Benson. So those three intellectuals had pushed, uh, had been agitating for change for a long time. And within the church leadership itself, there were, there was elder John A. Widso, who died in 1952. So his reach was a little limited by his early death. And also an apostle named Adam S. Benyon, a beloved educator in Utah uh, in the mid 20th century. And then closer within the quorum or within the the leadership was a lower ranking general authority by the name of Marion D. Hanks and who didn't push for change publicly, but certainly made it his views known to President McKay and to other leaders. And then the biggest agitator for change, which is hard, I think, for Latter-day Saints to to understand because one can't imagine this would happen today. And that is um, a man named Hubie Brown who was um, called into the first presidency in the early 1960s. And Hubie Brown had this longstanding aversion to the ban. Didn't think that it was compatible with the scriptures when God said, or when Jesus said, you know, I'm no respecter of persons. Um, That really didn't set right with uh, President Brown. And so what Brown had done is he had tried for a long time to get, um, Nigerians, the church was interested in expanding in Nigeria in the early 1960s, and it was an experiment. They had never really tried in earnest to move into uh, a sub-Saharan um, African country. And, but with the ban in place, that meant that white missionaries from Utah had to go to those African countries. So uh, President Brown seized the moment and tried to convince his colleagues that the Aaronic priesthood is what they needed. And that's, of course, the preparatory priesthood to the higher, more powerful Melchizedek priesthood. And President McKay uh, listened to him. And President McKay said, well, if we give them the Aaronic priesthood, they're going to want the Melchizedek priesthood. 
And Brown turned to the elderly president and he said, that's the point, president. <laughs> that's why it's called a preparatory priesthood. <laughs> So McKay sees the writing on the wall and a number of men in the quorum, they recognize they're trying to move into Nigeria. They, they know that the church's mission is to preach the gospel to every kindred nation, tongue and people. But yet that it's hard to do that if you have white missionaries running all black churches. So uh, Hubie Brown gets enormous pushback from what I call the hardliners in the quorum of 12, namely Joseph Fielding Smith, who's the namesake of the founding prophet, Joseph Smith, his father, Joseph F. Smith, was the church president and prophet for a while. And so Joseph Fielding Smith had been in the quorum since 1910 and had several positions in the church. And he wrote an early book called The Way to Perfection, which was the Bible, if you will, for Latter-day Saints in the mid 20th century. The church lessons were patterned after his views on race in which he articulates a curse and also talks about uh, black people being less valued than preexistence. And so his book uh, becomes, uh, they study it in church, youth and adult Sunday school manuals. And the brethren recognize that Joseph Fielding Smith is the great doctrinal expositor of these, these racial teachings. So they look to him for answers on race. And so when Hugh Brown is pushing to end the ban, he's coming up against this well-established doctrinal figure in Joseph Fielding Smith. And I might add one other thing that Joseph Fielding Smith and Harold B. Lee, his associate, felt the same way. And they argued that God had favored lineages, that God privileged people of um, the lineage of Ephraim, which at one point, some of the church leaders like Smith argued were people from uh, Northern Europe, which of course are predominantly white uh, countries. And so it's, it's, it's uh, people from Ephraim who would run the church. And so with this idea of favored lineages, Hugh Brown thought that that was just utterly incompatible with scripture. And when the Book of Mormon says that all are likened to God in Brown's eyes, that really, that's what it meant. But for Joseph Fielding Smith, it meant something different. Hmm. So, uh, and, and U.B. Brown's eventually to drop from the first presidency, right? Yeah. So just to add one little thread. So, um, Hugh B. Brown doesn't just stop at trying to get Nigerians ordained to the Aaronic priesthood. He does something that would be completely unthinkable to today's leadership. He talks to the press and he says, this is what's going on behind closed doors. And for those of your listening audience who may not know how the church works, when these um, discussions among the high church leaders take place, they're confidential, they're privileged. And so Brown is taking privileged information and talking to a reporter like, like you guys. Mm-hmm. And in this case, oh, for those days. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. I just love that if someone called you and said, a member of the first presidency, the highest governing body, and said, hey, I've got to tell you some stuff off the record that you can write about. But don't yeah. disclose me as the source. And so he reaches out to Wallace Turner of the New York Times. And Wally Turner had been writing about Mormons for a long time, had an interest in Latter day Saints. And so Turner, of course, is just, this is electrifying to Turner. You know, and, and Brown is not any ordinary person. He is on the inside. So he, uh, in 1963, um, Brown tells Turner, he says that we're, we're thinking about lifting the ban. And actually 1962, he tells Turner, we're thinking about lifting the ban. You should tune in to the April 1962 General Conference. There's going to be a startling surprise. And Turner writes about this. And anyway, so Brown will meet with Turner at least three more times over the course of his life. And he's using Turner to put pressure on his colleagues to change the ban. And I'll just add one more thing that by November, the fall of 1969, Brown has absolutely had it with the the uh, the brethren's inability to change their views. And it's not David O. McKay. David O. McKay would lift the ban if he had consensus among the 12, but he doesn't. It's the hardliners that stand in Brown's way. And so in the fall of 1969, amidst a federal investigation and also amidst protests uh, against BYU athletic teams, these two events are happening at the same time and all of this bad publicity. Brown meets in secret with David O. McKay's sons. And he says to the sons, he said, look, we've got to change the policy before your dad dies. Will you help me? And the two sons, David Lawrence and Llewellyn McKay, agreed to it. 
So they go to the Hotel Utah in November, actually September of 1970, and they convince President McKay, who's now very old and in poor health. He's got moments of lucidity. He's got moments where he's essentially not alert. And on this day, at least I like to think he was alert. And the uh, other counselor in the first presidency, a guy by the name of Alvin R. Dyer, gets word that something sinister is about to take place. So he accompanies President Brown and the two McKay sons to the Hotel Utah. And at that moment, um, David O. McKay uh, hears from his sons that the ban needs to go. It's not a doctrine. It's a policy. And the reason why it's the McKay sons leading the charge is because Brown, Brown had exhausted his capital with the president years before this, badgering him to lift the ban. And so the McKay sons decided to take the lead. And so what, um, what they decide to do it, when they go through the rationales about the policy and the doctrine uh, disputes, Alvin R. Dyer listens to this and he is furious because he thinks that it's, there's nothing that's true about it being a policy. It is a doctrine, and he had learned that from Joseph Fielding Smith and others. And so he puts a, mounts a big resistance. And what Dyer doesn't know is that President McKay had already made plans to ordain a black man to the priesthood by the name of Monroe McKay. This is in September of 1969. Uh, Monroe McKay was not any ordinary black Latter-day Saint. He had taught at the hotel or he had worked at the Hotel Utah for, I think, like 26 years. By that point, he was a faithful member. People have been asking him for decades. Uh, how do you feel about the ban? And he would always bear testimony. He would always say the right things in public, that the ban is God's will. I'm patiently waiting for it to change. But in private, Monroe Fleming had been telling people like Lowell Benyon and others that he wanted the priesthood and didn't understand why he couldn't have the priesthood. And just go off the script for a quick moment that Joseph Fielding Smith, the, the great uh, church um, doctrinal uh, expert, uh, Monroe Fleming would meet with Joseph Fielding Smith often and ask about the ban. And Joseph Fielding Smith would then recount the traditional views of that black people bore a biblical curse and they were less valiant. And he would take 15 or 20 minutes to go through all of these traditional teachings. And then Monroe Fleming, with the great sense of humor that he had, he would say, now tell me again why black people can't have the priesthood. <laughs> and I'm sure that agitated Joseph Fielding Smith, who was a very serious man. But anyway, uh, Monroe Fleming was the first person that President McKay had agreed to ordain. And when word got out uh, to Alvin Dyer, um, it set off alarm bells. And Alvin Dyer contacted the most dominant church authority at the time, a guy named Harold B. Lee. He was the most influential apostle in the 1950s and 1960s. A lot of the brethren deferred to him. He would ultimately succeed President Smith as the next church president. And the reason why he was so powerful and influential is because Joseph Fielding Smith was 93 when he became the church president in April of 1970. And a lot of saints thought that he wouldn't be around very long, and they thought right. And so they predicted that 73-year-old Harold B. Lee would, be the, would succeed him because that's where he fell in the line of authority. And they predicted that it would be like David O. McKay, in which uh, President McKay served from 1952 to 1970. And so a lot of folks thought, based on uh, uh, Harold B. Lee's youth, youth, he's said, Relative youth, yeah. Relative uh -huh. youth, yeah. that he would serve for two decades. And it turns out that didn't happen. He died after a short period in office. But that's why they deferred to him is because mm -hmm. they thought he'd be the church president for a long time. And so um, Alvin R. Dyer, when he found out that President McKay was set to ordain Monroe Fleming to the priesthood, he contacted Harold B. Lee. And Harold B. Lee um, contacted Hubie Brown, strong-armed President McKay, also also contacted Spencer W. Kimball, who supported President Brown in ordaining Monroe Fleming to the priesthood. And um, President Lee um, nudged or coerced, if you will, uh, Elder McKay into changing his support. Hmm. And so this is sort of where it's at in the fall of 1970, is that there's a push, at least among a few people in the high church leadership, to ordain this black man and, and then the hardliners get word of it and they put an end to it. 
And when this happens, um, Hubie Brown, who had been agitating for change for, for a long uh, period at this point, he was absolutely crushed. He was depressed. He was, he was uh, really bothered by the fact that this was the chance to do it. And he told uh, a confidant, he said that this was our last chance to end the ban because if President McKay doesn't do it, his successor won't do it, and his successor's successor won't do it. And he's talking about Joseph Fielding Smith and Harold Lee. And of course, he was right. So, um, so Dave, you mentioned that Harold, uh, that Hubie Brown was dropped in the first presidency over this activism. Mm-hmm. And it's absolutely true. And when he died in December of 1975, he called Spencer W. Kimball into his office, now president or his home. And uh, so President Kimball, who's now the church president, paid this elderly um, apostle uh, a visit. And QB Brown looked at Spencer Kimball in the eyes and he said, promise me you'll lift this ban. And Elder or President McKay, or excuse me, President Kimball made that pledge that he would lift the ban, but it would take time. Yeah, let's let's fast forward then. Uh, so, so Joseph Fielding Smith comes in. Harold B. Lee ends up only being president for 18 months. Kimball comes in. We talked about how he wanted to lift the ban, was building consensus. How did uh, we talked about Bruce Harmer uh Joseph Fielding Smith's son-in-law. Uh, how did after the, the revelation that that President Kimball says lifted led to the lifting of the ban? How did McConkie in the immediate exaggerate the revelation? ending the ban. And, and how did President Kimball address that? Yeah. So if I can go back just a little bit, Dave, for a moment, yeah. um, that Elder McConkie, I think this is an important part of the story. Elder McConkie uh, succeeds his father-in-law as the, the prime doctrinal expert in the church. The brethren look to McConkie to answer doctrinal questions, much as they did his father-in-law, Joseph Fielding Smith. And President Kimball recognizes intuitively that he can't lift the ban as long as Elder McConkie poses is is opposed to it because he knows that the brother and look to McConkie for guidance. And so President Kimball meets with Elder McConkie in private and he tells him, he says that, look, we've got to lift this ban. We have this temple in Brazil. And he says to Elder McConkie, so what do you think we should do about this with this temple? And it's kind of comical when he asks this question, what should we do? Because President Kimball knows what needs to be done. But as the brilliant leader that he was, he wants to make Elder McConkie part of the solution. And in 2003, Elder McConkie's son, who's a BYU religion professor, he passed away in 2013. But Joseph Fielding McConkie wrote a, this biography of his father. And I read the chapter on the priesthood revelation. And I, I, I started to laugh when I read it because Joseph Fielding McConkie gives his father all the credit without realizing that President Kimball <laughs> knew what needed to be done, but had used the right tactic in approaching it as a problem that needed to be solved. What do we do, Bruce? What do we do, Elder McConkie? So Elder McConkie um, is one of the first of the apostles to come online, to, to come on board, if you will, to recognize the ban needed to be lifted to globalize the church. And once Elder McConkie uh, came on board, President Kimball um, said that, I felt as though the moon, the stars, and the sun had been lifted from my shoulders because of Elder McConkie's support. So we use this Elder McConkie to, um, as sort of an ally to convince some of the other members of the 12 who were holding out and don't want to lift the ban. And anyway, after the revelation is done, um, President Kimball will praise Elder McConkie in private for his support. And when the revelation is done, Elder McConkie and Elder uh, Boyd K. Packer, um, who's in a close ally of Elder McConkie, they start to give firesides in the church in which they embellish some of the experiences that happened. And the things that they say, um, they would say stuff like the church presidents appeared to the brethren in the 12 on June 1st. Jesus himself, Elder Packer said, appeared and told us that we needed to lift the ban. And President Kimball, when, when those reports, those otherworldly reports filtered back to him, he was furious because that's not what he wanted to say. That's not what he said happened. And he didn't think that it needed to be embellished. And in fact, he told the brethren when this um, experience happened on June 1st, this wonderful sense of unity, um, as President Kimball put it, 
He said that we want to people to know, including the media, that the ban was changed because we listened to the Holy Ghost. It was the Holy Spirit that told us this is what needed to happen. There was no audible voice. There were no you know, manifestations. And so Elder McConkie, for whatever reason, decided to embellish the account. And some of the other apostles, um, junior apostle named David B. Haight got word of what was going on. And he, too, expressed uh, dissatisfaction to President Kimball. He said there was no voice. We didn't hear any audible voice. And then uh, President Hinckley, who would uh, be a counselor in the first presidency to uh, first to Spencer Kimball and then to Ezra Taft Benson. Um, in 1988, uh, President Hinckley gave a, an address in conference to the, to the priesthood holders of the church. And he said that no audible voice was heard to our ears. And that was an indirect reference to Elder McConkie, who had been dead by that point for three years. So anyway, Elder McConkie had been saying these kinds of things and President Kimball called him in and he rebuked him. He said, please don't uh, say these things. And in the meantime, the church, this had been spreading like wildfire throughout the church. And as a youth growing up in the 1980s in Maine, I heard these stories. And of course, like most Latter-day Saints, I was intrigued by them. I didn't know the source or the origin, but I was intrigued by them. And so. Um, so President Kimball was simply more modest in how he wanted the story to be told. So even after the end of the ban, and you alluded to this, top church leaders were still really concerned about interracial marriage. Um, there, there doesn't at least appear from the top to be that kind of angst. Has that dissipated now? Well, I sure hope so, Dave. <laughs> but uh, I mean, this was a global church, right? Uh -huh. 17 million members, most of whom lived outside of the United States. But what I found in my research was that a couple of things that the brother and some of the brother and not all, but some of the brother are really worried about interracial marriage. And one of the things that, that happened in 1978 was Elder Marky e. Peterson of one of the apostles was out of the country in South America when the ban was lifted. And that was by design. He didn't show any indication in the months and days leading up to the revelation that he supported a change. So President Kimball uh, made sure that he was out of the country when that happened. And but one of the things that Elder Peterson said when he learned about that the ban had been lifted, that he insisted that there would be an interracial disclaimer that would be published next to the priesthood revelation um, in the Deseret News. And. So that was his insistence. And what happened was it sent mixed messages to Black Latter-day Saints because the ban had been lifted. They can now enjoy the privileges of the temple. But yet they're still being told that they cannot marry interracially. And also at BYU in 1981, there's a committee that the um, BYU basketball coach named Frank Arnold chairs. And one of the history faculty at BYU is on this committee. And Frank Arnold tells the committee that the brethren still want to keep the number, the, the number of black students at BYU to a minimum because they fear interracial marriage. And on the other hand, there are uh, people like Marion Hanks and some other general authorities who are fully supportive of interracial marriage because they think it will help break down these racial barriers. And so what you see happen is, is that there are, there are um, some leaders who still cling to these older views of interracial marriage. And some of these views still show up in church manuals, even as late as 2010, 2011, mm -hmm. when the LDS, the youth of the church are still being taught to marry within their own race. And for a church that's growing at this point globally, and also for a church, let's say in Hawaii, where they've always been interracial. I mean, it's really hard to reconcile that white people should marry white people and Black people should marry black people. And so what happens is, is that a number of um, black and biracial and frankly, white and brown Latter-day Saints, they push back on these manuals and some of the other leaders who are teaching it. And by 2013, the church will officially repudiate this idea that it's a sin to engage in interracial marriage. Yeah, that I, I wanted to talk about that next a little bit. That, and they officially in this essay, this forceful essay, officially denounced those previous justifications you've mentioned, like uh, black members were less valiant in the preexistence or 
lineage or curses. All those things are 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 discarded, saying they were wrong. Um, and then the church kind of rather unceremoniously stops publishing Bruce R. McConkie's Mormon doctrine, which was kind of like a staple next to scriptures in many Mormon homes for a long time. Do you think most members are aware that those teachings on race have been rejected? Boy, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to ask you what you what you think on that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me let me say a, a quick antidote. So. Last year, where I live in Colorado, two young men came to my door, knocked on my door, and they were selling solar panels. And uh, I knew right away, I just had a strong feeling that they were, they were former missionary companions. So I said to them, and I should tell you that one of them had a few, some facial hair, one of them had longer hair. So they didn't look like missionaries, but I knew they were. And I said, you guys are missionaries, aren't you? And I just sort of froze. And I said, laughingly, I said, I know missionaries when I see them. So I had them in and uh, we were talking about solar panels a little bit. And, and then I told them I went to BYU. We talked about the church a little bit. And then the, one of the young men who came to my door, they were probably 24, 25. He was biracial. And he said, I'm reading this fascinating new book. It's called Mormon Doctrine. Have you ever heard of it? <laughs> and and no, I should tell you that I didn't tell them that I'm a scholar of Mormon race relations. I've written a lot about this. I didn't say anything. I'm just curious. And, and so he asked me, have you heard about this book? And he turned and I, I turned to the other kid who was, who was Caucasian. And I said, have you heard about this book, Mormon Doctrine? He said, no. And so mm. anyway, I asked the biracial kid, I said, what do you think about Mormon Doctrine? It's really strange. And so the race stuff. And so the story, of course, is that the Elder McConkie is being lost to a new generation of Latter-day Saints because his book went out of print in 2010. And the church leaders were trying to move away from that. And the Mormon doctrine had been giving the church fits for a very long time from black members who were reading this, you know, these offensive passages. And they were bothered by it, that this is a church that's supposed to be racially inclusive. But yet books like Mormon Doctrine are still being sold at, you know, uh, Desert Book and other uh, church affiliated uh, bookstores. So anyway, it reached a crescendo in 2010. And without going into the, all the details, um, they decided to pull Mormon Doctrine from print after numerous Latter-day Saints had complained. And uh, when they remove it from print, it's, it's not, they don't, there's no fanfare. You guys were the only ones to do the story. Peggy, I think it was you who did it. It was. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I should tell you something about what happens with this. So I went into the church headquarters just after this had been pulled. And I met with Mike Otterson, who was the head of the church public relations, a wonderful man. And I told him I was doing some research on blacks in the church, uh, black people in the church. And I said, I have some questions about Mormon doctrine and why it was pulled. And I quoted from Peggy's story a little bit that, you know, and I said, I love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the, the desert book people said that it, it yeah. So I said, look, this is a, a best-selling book. You know that. And I know that, but I'm not here to beat anybody up. I'm not here to do that. I don't do that sort of gotcha thing. I'm just here to get a sense of what happened. And he looked at me and he said, you and I both know what happened. This stuff is really outdated and it shouldn't be circulated. And I said, right. I said, I'll tell you what, I need a statement from you or from the church. And when I go back to Colorado, I'll write the statement about why it was retracted. And he said, that's fine. And he said, I'll have to, to send it up the chain to the apostles in the first presidency. It might take a couple of months. Be patient. And I said to Brother Otterson, I've got all the time in the world. So anyway, I wrote the statement, a couple of paragraphs. He made a couple of minor changes to it. But that was the statement that the brethren had approved. And I, I quote from that in my book. But I should tell you that there's a parallel thing that happens with a couple of particular Black Latter-day Saints. I don't really have license or authorization to share the story, but I'll just throw out a teaser that a couple of Black Latter-day Saints had been reading it and they really made a big stink about the book. And they called Sherry Dew and they said, this is offensive. How could you be selling this? And, you know, 
her response was, this sell, makes a lot of money for us. And the, 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 um, the exchange was, really? You're focused on money? What about on doing the right thing? So they came to a conclusion to remove it from print. And there's a deeper backstory to all of this. But anyway, um, one other little anecdote that might be interesting that I heard secondhand, so for whatever it's worth, but one of my friends at the church um, history department told me a funny story. They were talking to former church president Gordon B. Hinckley um, on one occasion, and they brought up Mormon doctrine. And President Hinckley allegedly said that Mormon doctrine left us a pile in the po- left a pile of poop in the street and we're still cleaning it up. Mm. And that was something that, you know, President Hinckley was really a bridge builder and he really wanted to make it right with the black community. And it was hard to do that if you had this book in print still. Well, speaking of Gordon Hinckley, I have two quick questions about him. One is in your, again, back in, in your um, chapter about explaining this doctrine to the public. It was Gordon Hinckley, you say, who came up with the we don't know why uh, theory, which is get rid of all these justifications, but still claim that it's came from God. And I still hear people saying that today. It's still say people still saying it was inspired and we don't know why. Do you hear that? I mean, that yeah. was Gordon Hinckley, right? He the PR man. Well, he didn't. He didn't come up with that. The when President Brown was on his crusade in the late '60s, the Harold B. Lee and some of the other leaders decided to make a statement that the first presidency would sign, and the statement simply said that reaffirm the rationales for the ban, but also said that God never revealed why this ban was in place. And that would have been December of 1969. And so what happens is over the years, a quasi official line of the church is if anybody asks a missionary or a member, you know, why the ban occurred, the line would be, we don't know why. And theologically, that's problematic because the church, the wonderful thing about the church and the gospel and the way that the church teaches, there are answers for a lot of things. But to suggest that you don't know why God banned the saving rituals of the church for millions of people just didn't set well with a lot of people, including black Latter-day Saints. And I know one of the the men that you've had on your program over the years was um, our mutual friend, Darius Gray and Darius Gray and some other black Latter-day Saints um, sort of filled in the gaps of their own, trying to make sense of the ban. And and in Darius's case, I talk about this in my book and Darius's case, he argue, or he, he says that, um, God had allowed the ban to happen to see how people would treat each other in the church. And then another uh, Black Latter-day Saint, a guy named Keith Hamilton, told me something the exact opposite, that the ban was was inspired by God for reasons that we don't know about. And so those are obviously two different positions from these both faithful Latter-day Saint men. And so the we don't know line allowed people to move in and, and to sort of... Um, devise their own rationales for the ban. So what happens is by the early 21st century, the we don't know line is not sustainable because the internet explodes all of this stuff. When people, Latter-day Saints and non-Latter-day Saints can just, you know, two clicks away and find the Journal of Discourses or find the writings of Elder McConkie or Joseph Fielding Smith. I mean, if somebody were to tell Joseph Fielding Smith or Elder McConkie that we don't know why the ban existed, they would tell you they were nuts, right? They spent their entire ministry talking about why the ban existed. Black people were cursed. They were less valiant. And so the we don't know line, in my opinion, is just a throwaway line. It's a public relations line because it's no longer fashionable or popular or accepting to say that black people were cursed or they were less valiant. And so that's the line they come up with. And by the early 21st century, it's no longer sustainable because people can read the writings of these older church leaders and they can recognize that. Um, They're not compatible with the new church PR line. And yet uh, then Gordon, you say that Gordon Hinckley's outreach to the black community, which he did as president, was his, quote, finest accomplishment at church president. What did he do? Oh, my goodness. I mean, he's I think he's one of the he and President Kimball and some others are certainly among the heroes of this story, in my opinion. 
And President Hinckley recognizes that the church has been on the outs with the black community for a long time. One of the things that bothered him was one of his colleagues in church leadership, Ezra Taft Benson, who would later go on to be the church president, that uh, in the 1960s, he was um, a part of the John Burt Society, which is an anti-communist organization that absolutely vilified the civil rights movement and its leaders, including Dr. King. And so the NAACP, um, a black civil rights group, they were on the outs with the church. And um, the church didn't like the NAACP in the 60s and the NAACP didn't like the church. And so President Hinckley wanted to make amends for that hostility that was frankly generated by his colleague, Elder Benson. And so one of the things that President Hinckley does is he agrees to speak at the NAACP convention in um, the spring of 1998. It's the first time that a church leader has ever met with this convention. And this is the, I should tell you again, the group that was once vilified by a major apostle as being communist aligned. So it was a major breakthrough. And also because of President Hinckley's um, leadership of the NAACP, he led the charge to get the state to, to honor the Martin Luther King federal holiday. And the other thing that President Hinckley does is he forms relationships with black leaders, including a black Baptist minister in California. And so meets with the minister, apologizes broadly for the church's role in fostering racism. And a church president had never done this before. And one of the things, in my opinion, that I, I'm, I'm certain that President Russell Nelson, the current leader of the president of the church and prophet, that if he were hearing me say this today, I'm certain he would agree with this, which is that President Nelson would not be able to have forged these close ties of the NAACP like he has in the past few years, had it not been for Gordon B. Hinckley blazing the trail. I was just going to ask you a little bit about Russell Nelson's efforts. He is really building upon what Hinckley did, right? And, 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 and apparently making some progress and winning some, some friends and influence there on that. Let me turn to another one. You know, even you, you brought up Darius Gray, you know, even even faithful Black Latter-day Saints like Darius now believe the church needs to formally apologize for for the past ban to, quote, help heal the church. What, what do you say to that? Boy, so when I first started talking with Darius about my research on on Black Latter-day Saints, this is my second book on the topic. So and I've done dozens of articles. So I've interviewed him many times over the years. We've met for different lunches when I'm in town in Salt Lake. And at first I asked Darius about that. I said, do you want the church to apologize? And he said, no, I don't think an apology is necessary. This would have been six or seven years ago, or maybe even longer, actually longer. But anyway, um, the last time I interviewed Darius would have been maybe a year and a half ago. And he was emphatic that the church needed to apologize. And one of the things that he said was that the church cannot heal unless there's an apology. And I want to share something that I think is critical to this discussion is that the, the church is the racism the church members feel today, at least in my experience. And the, the racism that circulates today is less theological and more political. That is, there's nobody at church or few people at church, I'm certain, that are talking about biblical curses and less valiant stuff. And that's the beauty of the race and priesthood essay that we referred to, where the church denounced all of these things in 2013. So a, a good brother at church or a good sister can hold this document up and say, you know, the church no longer teaches these things. We shouldn't teach them. But so the issue today is less about the theological racism that was once so prevalent. And it's more um, about uh, politics and people being insensitive to racial equality and to um, Black Lives Matter and all of that stuff. And so Darius and I have talked about this and he shares my sentiment that it's politics driving the racism today in the church and less so about theology. Yeah, that could be a whole other show, right? <laughs> the whole politics and what that's doing. Uh, well, let me ask you a, a, a final question. Uh, given what you, you see the whole arc of the ban, how it came about, how it persisted, how it was lifted, how it's still causing issues. Do you see similar pressures? Uh, and this was brought up in your book too, building uh, for ending 
the essential ban on women joining the priesthood? Well, I think that, um, or maybe we can say LBGTQ if we wanted to throw that, that too. in. too, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that people are going to read my book and they're going to argue, you know, at least they can read what they read and see what they see. But, you know, the question is, are the brethren susceptible to pressure? I'm not saying that's what makes them change things. Certainly they they do things as they feel inspired to make changes. But to suggest that they're not um, moved by outside influences, both within and outside of the church, would be remiss because they are. And they talk about this frequently in their quorum uh, minutes. and so. I know Elder Holland had said one time that a black man once asked him, when are we going to see a black Latter-day Saint? Um, Saw him at, I think, Lowe's. Imagine this, seeing a a senior apostle at Lowe's in his blue jeans on a weekend, (laughs) buying a a hoe for his garden. And (laughs) this black Latter-day Saint, who was the president of the Genesis group at the time, who's a black, which is a black support, Latter-day Saint support group. So a guy named Don Harwell, the president of the Genesis group, made a beeline for Elder Holland as he's in line to buy a hoe. And uh, he said, hey, when are we going to have a black apostle? I mean, absolutely no filter. And Elder Holland gave him a pretty straightforward answer. He said, when there's enough black Black Latter-day Saints, there might be a a time when that occurs. And notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, you know, when God tells us, when this, when that. He said, Mm -hmm. look, when there's a critical mass of black people, he didn't give numbers, but when there's a critical mass of black people, maybe that might might happen. And I think the same, uh, Dave, is true of maybe um, women being ordained to the priesthood or maybe LBGTQ plus that I'm not saying that that pressure is going to force the change. That's not what I want to say, but I will say that that pressure gets the brethren to talk about it and you can't make changes unless you talk about it first. And what, what Latter-day Saints, I think it's important to understand is how revelation works for the church institutional revelation which is that they talk about these things first. They debate and discuss and debate. And that's the word they use, debate. And then once they reach a consensus, they pray about it. And once they pray about it, the church president says, with the consensus, I feel to say that we've had a revelation. So it really is a more pragmatic uh, process than I think most Latter-day Saints realize. And in order for women to get the priesthood and maybe LBGTQ um, folks to have more rights in the church, it really starts with those critical discussions at the quorum level. Mm. As your book so revealingly shows, these talks go on for sometimes quite a while, obviously, and get very intense. The name of the book, again, is Second Class Saints, Black Mormons and the Struggle for Racial Equality. Comes highly recommended. Matthew Harris, thanks for joining us. Oh, it's been a pleasure. And good luck with the book, okay? Thank you. I appreciate that. And thanks to Peggy Fletcher Stack. Always a pleasure. And our producer, Chris Samuels. We remind you that you can keep up on all the happenings in and about the church by subscribing to the Salt Lake Tribune's free Mormon Land newsletter. Just go to sltrib.com to sign up. And we'll talk again next time on Mormon Land. Mm-hmm.